from the Attention Era Media Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn. And this is Simon Provan. A very happy Thursday to you, Simon. Happy 1st of December. Yeah, that's right. It well. is December. Wow. It's not even cold out. Uh, it's cra- Well, it's it's a little more chilly, but yeah, there's, there's no snow on the ground. It's not uh, freezing temperatures. It's odd. I'll take it for now. The, le- the least amount of snow possible is, is, is fine, I think. I don't think anybody really wants snow yet. Yeah, you know, if my girls, of course, want it, especially my youngest one. But, you know, she's not the one who has to shovel it when, exactly. it, when it falls. Like, Dad, it snowed. <laughs> I'm going to go play. You go shovel for four hours. Have right. fun. Love you. Bye. It's like, uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, the, the cool thing is, is I've got two kids that now are, you know, it's time. A it's nine-year-old, a thirteen-year-old, yeah. they can start getting the shovels out. The Earn problem is, key. I gotta, I gotta go buy the shovels in order for them to ah, help me out. So, okay, do you have a snow? Are you more of a snowblower? Or a I've actually have a. I, for the past couple of years, I've had a plow on the front of my uh, my riding lawnmower oh, that I put I on. I know some people that do do that. But now I've got, I've got a little crack on the metal in there. So the repairman said I wouldn't be doing that plow much more. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, we have an exciting show for you. Oh, uh, that's today. right. We're here to talk about here, soccer. Are, we are here for soccer. <laughs> believe it or not, um, today's show brought to you by Blaine's. Har- Hardware? No, that's not at Farm and Fleet. Something. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're kidding. Don't sue yes, us. Don't sue us. No, two great guests for you today, though. Kyle Gregg from Vancouver Whitecaps Two will be here to join us to talk about his absolutely incredible season for Whitecaps Two FC uh, in the USL. And then uh, later on, we'll be joined by Jason Davis from Sirius XM FC. He hosts the United States of Soccer to help us try to sort out all the madness that took place in Toronto last night. And, of course, kind of look ahead to the the, the, uh, the MLS Cup between Seattle and Toronto as well. Yeah, and, of course, I was listening to Jason's show on the way over uh, talking about promotion relegation. and, and, and Seems uh, to be a know, hot topic. Well, and, and it, he seems to get wrapped up into it, not himself, but people really like to go after him. It's it's interesting. So he's, if he's, we have time, maybe we talk about it. easy to about that, I've noticed. A couple of times I've heard him talk about it, too. I'm like, he really just, he's like, all right, people. It's like, I guess get it it's right like, okay well here's the that. thing baxter and maybe I'm, I'm going to the kick around uh brought to us by of course too much metal a little too early but the demise of the nasl or the not demise of the nasl my the reason i bring that up is you know there was an owner's meeting uh last night two nights ago yeah um usl representatives were at the nasl owners meeting yep. sunil galati was there uh you know peter wilt had tweeted out a friend of the show that the NSL is not dead, but right now it doesn't look very healthy. And the one thing I would say about the promotion relegation argument is you can't have promotion relegation until you have a healthy second division. Yes, and they're trying to figure out that whole second division status. I think USL filed for second they division did. status, and the NASL has been all over the place as well. Well, so. Rayo, Oklahoma, who's owned by Rayo... Uh, Real Salt Lake? No. No, no. Rayo Valencia out of Spain. Right. Uh, they, they, looks like they're done. The players who had multi-year contracts have been released. There were no representatives at the NASL meeting with that team. That's an NASL team, right? Yeah. 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 So, but apparently there is talk about three other teams joining the NASL. So, and I think that's where Peter was coming from, is that, look, we still have people interested in joining this league, but I, you, but you can't have doing, teams in and out. Is it doing any good, though? That's really my common question when I come back to looking at the NASL. The USL, right. we know, is doing good. It's got the, the, you know, the younger players coming through the ranks. They're having the opportunity to work themselves through, the, you know, up into MLS and all that partnership. But sure. I just don't ever get the sense that the NASL is doing anything positive for the game of soccer. Well, one of the worrying things... Obviously, their their most, not their biggest. I wouldn't say it's actually their biggest club, but the most well known club, of course, is the Cosmos. Yeah, and there's rumors that they may be looking at the USL. Yeah, you know, if that happens, that that it signifies a lot. Now, you do have healthy teams, you do, like the Indy Eleven. Yeah, who, of fantastic. course, Peter has helped put together. Um, but but you're looking at teams in the USL, FC Cincinnati. Having a fantastic year, over thirty six thousand fans yeah. breaking record after record. They have a great relationship with the Cincinnati Reds. I was just reading about this last night as I well. FC Baxter, Cincinnati was USL. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, when I'm sorry, when, I'm sorry. when you're okay. looking at the yes, difference yes, in the yes. leagues, is is you got one club in in the USL that is, you know, out attending every NASL team, mm-hmm. which this season wasn't unusual for any USL team to out-average a NASL team. But but you look at a club like FC Cincinnati, they got a great relationship with the Cincinnati Reds. Mm-hmm. They actually have a standing agreement that they won't schedule games 
on the same night. That only happened once. Okay. Uh, but but they promote each other. Wow. You know, so so when you look at a club working like that, and then you look at the Cosmos, who I'm just going to say it, who do nothing but bash the MLS clubs yep. in their town, and then can never beat them when they play. Basically. Well, they they did beat they did beat uh, NYCFC in the Open Cup this year, and I, I think they beat the Red Bulls last year in the Open Cup. But again, you know, you're looking at once. You know. what what players are being used to exactly. by but my point is is you look at clubs in the USL who have these healthy relationships with other sports teams mm-hmm. in their town and then you look at the Cosmos there's nothing healthy about their relationships with any other club exactly and they're looking to steal people away rather than go okay how can we how can we make this work yeah so it's it, it'll be interesting to see but as I said you know it, it'll be fun to talk to Jason if we have time a little bit about that but I know the main <laughs> point is to talk to him mainly about uh the playoffs and the the wonderful game that was last night. <laughs> unbelievable, absolutely. Well, we speaking of another unbelievable game that took place last night. Um, we we all know that Toronto overall scored seven total goals in their series, but there was another team last night, Simon, that needed just ninety minutes to score seven goals. Who was that team? Yeah, that was the U.S. men's boys national team, the U17s over Portugal, which is what makes part of that scoreline. So incredible, so interesting. So yeah. this is the great age we live in, Baxter. On my TV. Streaming, of course. I wasn't on the uh, Fox Sports 1 because I got rid of the yep. satellite company I was with. But streaming the MLS playoff game on my TV and then watching the US U-17s on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, you know, again, we talk what about... world we live right, in. Right, right. Growing up, you know, watching one game a week from yeah. Germany. And, of course, it was a condensed game. And here I am watching two games, one of them being a U-17 national team game. A um, lot of fun. Listen, watching this game, the US, obviously, the scoreline is true of how dominating the U.S. was in this game. Yeah. I think if you're Portugal, you're looking at that young goalkeeper going, okay, I think he's done because mm. there there were some savable goals. Okay. But I'll tell you, the, the U.S. boys, if there's one thing they're still lacking, and I think we'll see this for quite a while, is that true technical skill on the ball. Mm. But what we, I did see that made me very hopeful is a lot of field awareness and a lot of beautiful passing, Baxter. There were, there were plenty of times where... You actually saw the U.S. work it so Portugal would get sucked into one side of the field and then the U.S. would quickly switch it and now you have a breakaway and that's how a lot of these goals were scored. And I think it was the third goal of the game. Right, listen, I'm not going to lie. I don't know a lot of these young boys' uh, Andrew Carlton names. scored the third. Uh, well, third total goal or Josh Sargent who scored Josh the Sargent okay. who's, who scored that third goal, if I'm remembering this correctly. But it was, it was a beautiful ball over the top, Baxter, with his left foot, takes it out of the air, slams it into the far post against Portugal. That's a clinical finish right there. Absolutely. So it's great when you see these young boys, these young Americans, scoring goals that way, passing like they were, being, as I said, being very aware of, of what was going on with the field and how they were able to manipulate that Portuguese defense to getting sucked into... Uh, as I said, one side of the field or the other and mm-hmm. completely take advantage of that. So, yes. It so was Andrew Carlton, by the way. Okay, Andrew Carlton. Yeah. Yeah, was and a, he's a recent Atlanta United signing Oh, as look well, at too. that. Look at that. So Atlanta United is probably excited about that. Uh, young player for them. Hey, it's always exciting when you see young, good players signing with the league as yeah. well. You exactly. Know? Yeah, do you want them to play in Europe at some point? Well, it depends on the player, of course. Of we've, course. we've learned that, or people should have. It depends on the club. Uh, but to see these young players sticking with MLS and, and, and what MLS is starting to finally do with their development mm-hmm. academies, it's, it's exciting to see. So these were the um, U.S. Nike friendlies, which yep. they do every year. I actually texted my brother Jake, who lives right down in the area, uh, coaches down at the IMG Academy, and, and had to ask him, so are, are you, I'm watching the game. Are you there tonight? He said, no, I'm not. I was going to go, but then I remember I get to watch these boys train every morning. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Rub it in, Jake. <laughs> like, Thanks, Jake. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, my gosh. That is kind of funny, though, to, to hear. we got to get him back on the show again sometime Yeah, soon. absolutely. Uh, we had him on last year, and it'd be fun to get his new perspective now that he is down there at IMG. Uh, one other thing we want to talk about, we talked about it on Tuesday as well, too. Uh, Chapecoise, the team from Brazil that uh, had a tragic uh, plane crash that killed 71 people. Uh, earlier on Tuesday, uh, there's been some information that has come out about uh, the team's ultimate demise, unfortunately, in the crash. Uh, one of the things that has come out, apparently the Colombian plane ran out of fuel. That's what caused the crash. People were, some were playing the whole, you know, foul play, like, oh, maybe there was, you know, a takeover, maybe there was something hostile that happened on the plane, or somebody tampered with the electrical wires. 
from all accounts right now, from the, the tape that was leaked from the, the pilot, he was talking to air traffic control saying, we're out of fuel, we're out of fuel, I don't think we're going to make it, and they were only 22 miles away from the airport. But it's interesting. Not very often do we hear of a plane make, you know, running out of fuel, Simon. And you and I were briefly talking about this off the air, and we both kind of raised our eyebrows like, that's, that seems a little odd that a plane just runs out of fuel. I'm reading a little bit more here, Baxter, as you were sharing that with the listeners. So it sounds like that that plane was actually requested to go into a holding pattern because another plane had been diverted with mechanical problems before them and had priority with landing. Mm. So they actually had to wait seven minutes. They're flying around the airport for seven seven minutes. So those seven minutes ultimately cost them. Right, and it says here that as the plane circled, by the way, this is out of The Guardian, which has been wonderful with covering this. As the plane circled in a holding, holding pattern... The pilot grew more desperate, shouting out, we are having complete electrical failure. We are without fuel. And they still weren't given clearance to land. Mm. Now, listen, before we went on air on the last show, I didn't want to touch it. But you had said, you know, there's there's some rumors out there that this game's taking place in Colombia. Cartel have something to do with this. Yep. Didn't want to bring it up because both of us felt it just wasn't the place, wasn't the time. Of course. But now that this is coming out, you got to wonder, not being a conspiracy theorist, but you got to wonder. Yeah. Was, was there something going on that, that the cartels had a hand in this? Exactly. Down on the ground, you know, telling air traffic control, be like, no, you, uh, you hold them up there for an X amount of time, and then, uh, then we'll, we'll see what happens kind of a thing. You, you don't know. You don't know yeah. that, especially. And we don't want to, of course, get too stereotypical, but South America is known for things like this. Well, so. Colombia especially. Yeah. I mean, it, since the 80s, it's since the 70s, since Escobar. Uh, if you haven't, if, by the way, if you haven't seen the the, what did the ESPN used to call those the thirty for thirties? Yes, they did a wonderful thing on uh, Escobar, not the soccer player who got shot, but the 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 great drug drug lord. Hmm. Now, a great meaning is in his power, not that he was a great man. Sure. Um, I don't know, Baxter. Maybe this is the most sad out of thing out of all of this that I read is just before going silent, the pilot had made a final plea to land, saying, "Vectors, señorita, landing vectors." last thing you heard hmm. but let's end on a positive note Atletico Nacional who was the team they were going to be playing against had requested Connable just name Shopee Quen's the champions yeah. of Copa Sud America which is amazing thumbs up to that Absolutely. they said yes let's do it uh, 45,000 people gathered in the stadium at wow. Atletico Nacional last night all the players stood in the circle with white flowers and, and honored who I think we can call victims yeah of this plane crash. I completely agree. All right, we're going to run to a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the NWSL, the rumor that Alex Morgan is going to France, or at least that's what Twitter says, and we all know how important Twitter is. We'll be back with more. It's Two Up Front, presented by Three Lions Pub. Back inside the studio, two up front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn. And this is Simon Provan. All right, Simon Provan, as we roll along with the show, we want to, of course, remind you that we you can be heard live on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12 to 1 p.m. Central Time right here on Spreaker.com. And you can also find our show on demand by going to our website, uh, the number 2, twoupfrontsoccer.com as well. Yeah, you can also find us on Facebook, Two Up Front uh, over there, and on Twitter, at Two Up Front Soccer. You can also find our personal handles, at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Provan. Okay, Simon, let's talk about Twitter for a moment, because according to Twitter, which we know is the end-all, be-all for news these days, uh, Alex Morgan possibly, maybe, sort of, is, depending on who you ask, going to France to continue her playing career, to well, Lyon. According to Dan Lawletta, who we actually... Tried to get on the show we today. Tried. But he was a busy guy uh, today. Busy guy. Uh, managing editor over there at Equalizing so- Equalizer Soccer. He was on the show a couple weeks ago. Uh, he had sent out a tweet that said a Facebook post on a French media outlet says Alex Morgan is visiting Lyon. Allison Lee, I probably should know who that is. I don't. She had yep. 
tweeted to that saying, fans, don't panic just yet. Several U.S. stars have visited other clubs and have not signed with them. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, Allison's a, is a fantastic uh, women's soccer person to, to follow on, on Twitter as well. Uh, I find it interesting, too, that it's Alex Morgan because the whole reason that she basically went to Orlando in the beginning, kind of to an extent, was obviously to help start the franchise, but that's where her husband plays. His soccer is at Orlando City as well, so they were trying to maybe make that happen. That's why Sydney LaRue is in Kansas City, which is where Dom Dwyer is, which is where the family is. So that's why all these transfer rumors with Dom Dwyer, too, were kind of like, no, it's not going to happen. Well, what's interesting about this Lyon rumor, though, is that apparently... To add to the rumors mm. is that Leon is actually offering her husband a spot on the team as well. Not necessarily with the first team, but perhaps say, with the second team. To my knowledge, her husband is not that good. Right. So right. if he's not even a starter in MLS, anyway, that's, that's besides the point. But I, I, I'm curious, if Alex Morgan, arguably the face of U.S. soccer right now, leaves the United States to go play her soccer elsewhere, I think she would be the only real notable player not playing in the United States. I think you're right. I, yeah, I'd have to. I'd, like I'd have to pro, do a little high more. High profile, you know. Right. Tobin Heath is here. Meg, you know, Megan Rapino, all those gals. Yeah, Kristen Press. All everybody's here. Not to say that the NWSL is the end all be all, of course. But then you know, Alex, of course, gets the opportunity for Champions League and a lot of that other high profile European women's soccer, which well, is and, good. And you did see some of the European players like Kim Little out of yeah. Seattle. You did see them go back over to Europe because they missed the Champions League play. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, Kim Little was used to that to begin with. Alex Morgan has never experienced that, so there's right. maybe that possibility. And we heard Carly Lloyd a while, uh, over the summer, I think, was talking about going to Liverpool as well because she's like, I've always been a Liverpool fan. Yep. She's like, yep. I've got maybe four good years left in my career. Why not kind of a thing? And the deal obviously didn't end up happening. But it, it makes you wonder, though, if Alex Morgan were to leave, how would that affect U.S. soccer as a whole? How would that affect her image as a whole you in know, U.S. I, soccer? I, yeah, I, I, I don't think too much, Baxter, because... It's not like she's heading off to, uh, you know, play in Vietnam or yeah, something like that. And that's not to disrespect Vietnam, but I, I use that example because of Lee Wynn. Yeah. You know, he, he was doing okay over here. Then he went over to Vietnam. Now, for him, it was great because he became a superstar over there. Yeah. Uh, but totally fell off the map with the national team program. Yeah. You know, she if she signs, she's going to France. She's going to a, a club that everybody knows. Mm-hmm. So. The only worry would be is if that would start an exile for U.S. stars. Mm. That, to me, would be the, the, the worrying concept here. That is true. And we don't necessarily know. We know Alex is a leader, but we don't know that. If Alex goes, then does Megan Klingenberg start looking at things? Does Ali Krieger? Does Ashlyn Harris? Are people starting to like question themselves, be like, do I actually want to be an NWSL? Alex is getting paid how much money over there? Like, I want to go over there and play now and you know, have the opportunity to further my career and play Champions League. Well, and that's that's always going to be until the NWSL actually starts paying all of its players mm-hmm. a livable wage. That's going to have to be a concern. Yeah, I would completely agree with you on that one. I, I hope that the NWSL is able to figure things out. And we've had this conversation before, and I've had conversations with other people as well, too, that the national team right now fighting for more money for the national team players is only affecting like 20 or 30 players. It's not affecting the whole league as, you know, as all the players. And we, we referenced the Rachel Wood documentary from when, you know, she has to go get another job in the off season. These players are not doing what they're they can't fully embrace their passion. Well, it, it reminds me, too, of the early 90s here in the U.S., late 80s, in that one of the great things for the male players was having both indoor and outdoor leagues yeah, so they yep. could play all year long. And we see that a bit with some players playing in the W League in Australia. Yeah. However, at the same time, that's not the healthiest thing for your body, to basically never get rest. Exactly. Uh, so even there, too, you know, you're looking at is... Is having these players play all year long a good thing for the NWSL in in the end, or if if I don't at, know if it is, you yeah. know, at the end of the day, they're you know from what I understand they're not on their twelve month contracts mm-hmm. like you, you may have with MLS players, uh, but they also don't have any type of off season yes. where they can where they can stay in shape with perhaps even a trainer that they can afford. Yeah, yep, exactly. And just to kind of go off that with a literally day of example, we were supposed to have uh, Chicago Red Stars goalkeeper Michelle Dalton on the show today. We were really excited to have her, but um, in the off season, because she's not being paid enough, and this is nothing against Michelle, we love her, and we think she's a fantastic player, former Badger alumni, which is awesome, um, she's also a substitute teacher in the off season, and she got called in to, to work today, so which was fantastic, but that because of her not being paid enough through NWS, 
USL, she has to find other avenues, which, I mean, my heart's not broken. She couldn't be on the show, but you kind of get what I'm saying, though. Because she doesn't have that stability, she doesn't have the freedom to go and do other things as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's also, just to clarify, too, nothing against the Red Stars. It's just the state of... Exactly. The that's women's the game the and the way it, yeah, the way we it is. Yeah, we were completely understanding. We were like, oh, that's exciting. You know, good for you, know, good for you Michelle. But it just, you know, it's like how many other players that aren't national team players are, you know, working at grocery stores, working at Nike, working at Kate Spade, wherever. You know, it's like, what the heck kind of a thing. So until this offseason kicks back in or the regular preseason kicks back in and uh, April, I believe. So it's it's an interesting situation, to say the least. Uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts about this, Simon. The Carolina Railhawks are in the process of um, addressing an NWSL bid uh, next week, according to the Equalizer uh, from, from Tim Nash there at the Equalizer. Uh, we've already heard that Carolina and LAFC are two areas that the NWSL is looking to expand to. Carolina, we all know about UNC. We know that they are a powerhouse, and it's a lot. That's of, it. A lot of folks are saying, "Why don't they have a team?" That's yet, it. Kind of a thing. Exactly. So, uh, I think it makes total sense that Carolina gets a professional soccer team. That little East Coast hub right there, the Carolinas, Virginia, all those aside from, of course, those upper Eastern teams, is a huge soccer hub, especially for women's soccer. Dean Smith famously said. We are a women's soccer school. We're just trying to keep up with them when he was talking about the men's basketball program yeah. there. <laughs> so it does. You know, it's, it's one of those things. It does make sense. At the same time, just because the college team is successful doesn't necessarily translate into a pro team being successful. Yes, I completely agree with you. You know, when, where I went to grad school, University of Texas at Austin, Hook'em Horns. Woo! Obviously, the Longhorns down there, they're, they're basically a professional team, Oh, <laughs> the, yeah. the college football team. Uh, they did have an indoor or arena league football team down there that oh, just, yeah, yeah. They, were, they were there for a few years, but just horrible in attendance. So it doesn't always translate. I think sometimes because a program is so special, the other teams then aren't necessarily going to be as successful. But it'd be interesting to see. I, I think on paper it makes sense. I'd love to see it. Um, and I'd love to see the NWSL Maybe get a few more teams out west and in between the Midwest. Yeah. Frankly, more teams in the Midwest period would be great as well. Yeah. Well, we, we would love, a, obviously, we'd love a team here in Milwaukee, of course, but uh, to say the least. But uh, either way, though, uh, it's interesting to see uh, how this might develop. And hopefully Carolina and LAFC get their, get their teams. So, A uh, real quick update, Baxter. We were talking about a, a trade that the Houston Dash made sending yes. one of their defenders, uh, Alicia, Alicia Chapman, to Boston. We were a little confused by that. Yep. They did get a couple of uh, draft picks oh, good. for okay. that. I was hoping but, they were going to get somebody for that then. But the big move, the big move th- that they did a good job of keeping this under wraps. Yeah. They signed Brazilian Bruna. Oh, okay. The former as, as, uh, captain. That's right. Center back so captain. Th- that's okay. the newest defender for the Houston Dash. So Fantastic. now now we see why that move was made earlier this week. Makes a lot of sense to me. All right, when we come back, we will be joined by Kyle Gregg from Vancouver Whitecaps FC2. Don't go away. You're listening to Two Up Front presented by Three Lions Pub. Back to Two Up Front from the Attention Era Media Studios in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is Two Up Front presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn. And this is Simon Provan. All right, Simon Provan. Time to roll along with the program. Our first guest will be joining us on the shopfootsall.com. Call in line, as all guests do, of course, on Two Up Front. Uh, he was on several months ago as the USL season was just slowly starting to kick off. 
He was looking to make a name for himself, and make a name for himself he did in 2006. Absolutely. Uh, he wears the jersey number 47. He is from Kansas. Everybody loves a good Kansas boy. Uh, he joins us back on the program. It's Kyle Gregg, the captain of Vancouver Whitecaps 2. Welcome back to the program, Kyle. How are we doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for having me again. Absolutely, Kyle. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show. So last time you were here, Kyle, you and I had the conversation about, you know, expectations for the season. And, you know, you were, you know, given the the normal spiel of like, yeah, I'm going to see what I can do, do my best kind of a thing. And then you go out and you score bunches and bunches of goals. You get some first team minutes as well, too, with Vancouver. You just basically tell the soccer world, hello, everybody. My name is Kyle Gregg and I'm here to kick ass. (laughs) <laughs> um, how did how did you feel about your 2016 season? I think you did pretty darn good, didn't you? Don't you think? Yeah, I think I was very happy with it. Um, talking to some of my uh, my mentors and stuff as as I was making the move out to Vancouver, you know, I set a goal that I wanted to score a lot of goals in the season to kind of get myself uh, some attention, and I ended up doing that. And and then so I think I was obviously happy with with that and how how I started off the season pretty hot, but. Um, I kind of had had a slump um, f- for the second half of the season and didn't score as many goals as I want- wanted to. I think I ended with you know only three or four goals in the final you know, 15 games. So, um, but I, I guess that's something to force with. And so uh, overall, it was a good it was a good experience for me, and uh, you know uh, it was something I can um, and and really learn from. Well, Kyle, not only did you have a great season with uh, the Whitecaps too, as Baxter had mentioned and you yourself mentioned, but you had an incredibly important assist with the first team that helped send you guys into the quarterfinals of the CONCACAF Champions League for the first team. So I got to ask, has there been any more talk about you coming up to the first team for more of 2017? Well, uh, obviously, first off, I'll touch base on the the, the – the game that you're talking about, which was a significant game for me because I got to play uh, with the first team and I got to play in my home city with, you know, 20 plus fans watching me. So that was, that was a special one for me. And um, I was very, very happy that uh, the first team gave me an opportunity to do so. And um, uh, just hope that I get more opportunities in the future. You scored th- eleven total goals this season, you know, three total assists, and you're uh, you're twenty. You started twenty five of twenty seven games. It really kind of seems like it's starting to come together for you. I know the beginning uh, when we were talking a couple of months back. You know, we were we were talking about you know you using your size to your advantage. Um, now that you've had an opportunity to digest your your campaign as a whole, what did you learn about yourself this last season about your style of play that you were able to you know have so much success scoring and then of course being around the first team as well too and even playing in that friendly against crystal palace as well so i'm sure you got to see an entirely even new side of you that you you probably weren't used to seeing against an epl team yeah i think overall the the season was the biggest learning season that i think i've had so far in my career um and i think the credit goes to you know the white caps organization and you know the training sessions um, the environment that they set up set us up in to have success, and um, obviously I give credit to the coaching staff with Whitecaps too and the first team um, because um, it's just a really great environment. And really, at the end of the day, you only have to work worry about you know playing your football. And uh, I think the training sessions and the opportunities I was given throughout the season really kind of helped around me as a player. And I think um, before I would have said that I'm, I'm uh, more of a physical physical presence which i am but i think this season kind of helps uh, round me out a bit more with you know my link play as a forward and uh, uh positioning and, uh, and different things like that so it was definitely a big learning year for me kyle i have to ask you know you spent a couple of seasons with oklahoma city energy who obviously um didn't have as much of a relationship with an mls team like the vancouver whitecaps too does obviously a uh, you know, considered a development squad of Vancouver Whitecaps, but what I, I, what is it like to play with a team where you're trying to make the first team? So, so there's this paradox of you want to play well <laughs> for the team that you're with, but at the same time, you want to get noticed by the first team. What's what's it like to play? As I said, in that kind of paradox. <clears throat> yeah, I think I can understand where you'd come from and say that. It might be a, a different environment from, you know, maybe just a regular USL team that's not really closely affiliated with the an MLS team, but um, it, it is a little bit different. But at the same time, 
um, the most success that we had this past season and the most individual or the most individual success that each of us had on the Whitecaps two team was because we were playing for each other and not playing for ourselves. And, and the opportunities that some of, uh, of us guys got throughout the season with the first team didn't come. I mean, it came from maybe individual success, but at the same time, we wouldn't have got that individual success without, you know, putting the team first. And I think you can really see that the guys that did that, you know, got, got their chance and got rewarded. And there were several other of our, of my teammates that got to play in the friendlies and um, and a couple of my teammates even signed with the first team as well. So, you know, it was a good, uh, a good season for us. And I think um, again, uh, we had the most success we, we did when we uh, put each other first. You guys recently released your, uh, your player of the year for, for Whitecaps FC to Sem DeWitt. Uh, for those that don't know, number one, how to say his name properly. So I hope I said it properly, but uh, number two, Talk a little bit about having him on the team. Uh, he, he's from the Netherlands. He plays uh, plays that defensive spot, but uh, obviously a very bright spot for your squad in 2016. Yeah, Sam. He would he would he would say Devitt. Makes but sense. Devitt. <laughs> that's okay. The, that's the, that's the pronunciation. My American showing say. through. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but but Sam was huge for us this year. I think um, you don't see too many 21 year olds. Uh, center backs that have as much confidence and uh, kind of a presence about him um, on the on the pitch and really brings the guys around him and ma- and tries to make them um, all better. And I think he's another guy that uh, puts the team first and you know is very critical of his own performance and the team's performance. And um, he he's 21 years old, like you said, and in, in from the Netherlands, but he you know he plays like he's a veteran. And I think you know he's a very very exciting player and uh, could be a big future player for the Whitecaps. Well, Kyle, before we let you go, I'm always interested to ask players after they've they've played their full season, is there a game or two that sticks out to you from this 2016 season that will be more memorable for you than others to kind of remember, like, ah, oh, 2016 was fun or memorable because of this? Um, I think I, I'll pick two. I think the, the one game that sticks out to me the most is um, the game – with the first team that I got to play in Kansas city for, you know, for the reasons I, I told you before where I got to play in front of my family. Yes, I yep. got to, I got to contribute um, to, to the victory, which was, you know, really, really memorable for me. And then I'll say with the USL side, um, the most memorable was probably the, the, um, the Western conference semifinal when we played Oklahoma city. Mm. And uh, that was the third time we played in the season. And I finally scored on them. And you know, that was, <laughs> That was a big one for me. Um, Did you so, celebrate? Mm, I yeah, but <laughs> not not excessively. Of course, of course. So I mean, those are the two memorable games that really stick out to me. So I'll remember that for 2016. All right, Kyle, I can't let you go. You you play for a club in Canada. Last night there was an amazing match in Canada. Well, the last couple of weeks there's been an amazing two matches in Canada. Just curious if you got to watch the game at all with Toronto destroying Montreal five to two in that game alone, and your thoughts on it. I think, I mean, that was an awesome game. You know, the supporters in Vancouver, you know, didn't really want either team to win. But, <laughs> of course, um, of course. Watching that game, you know, it was, it was, it's always exciting to see an aggregate, aggregate game uh, go to extra time. And just the fact that, you know, the, uh, Toronto ended up winning that game and in front of their home fans, you know, it, it really shows how much it means to, to that team and to that city. And, you know, it's going to be an exciting final. Uh, with against Seattle. So that's the question, Vancouver fans. They're they're part of Cascadia. Do they cheer for Seattle or do they cheer for the Canadian club? Uh I I think they're going for a tie. <laughs> <laughs> 120 minutes just an endless penalty shootout. Nobody wins. Exactly. I love it. Yeah. All right, Kyle. Well, we have been uh, just thrilled to have you on the program again. So thank you so much for for stopping by. Uh, and we uh, we hope to do this again with you soon, okay? Absolutely. Thanks for having me again. Thanks, Anytime. Kyle. Kyle Gregg, there he goes from Whitecaps FC2 on the shopfutsal.com. Colin Line, when we come back, we'll be chatting with Jason Davis from the United States of Soccer on Sirius XM FC. Don't go anywhere. It's Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub.
Back inside the Attention Era Media Studios, it's two up front presented by Three Lines Pub. I'm Baxter Colburn. This is Simon Proven. All right, Simon Proven. Great conversation in our last segment with Whitecaps FC forward and Captain Kyle Gregg. Uh, second time having him on the program. Uh, great to have him on. Just a, a fun guy, but a very humble guy, too, which is fantastic. Yeah, and you got to believe that next season he's going to get some more first team time yeah, with, sure the, with the amount so. of goals he keeps scoring and, and how it's well he did presence. when he came up to the first team. Exactly. And he's a big body you know, forward, too. He's 6'2, almost, uh, I think, 185, 190. So that's, that's a pretty ideal size for, for a forward, I'd have to say. Absolutely. All right, well, we're going to shift gears. We're going to go from the West Coast over to the uh, East Coast, I do believe is where this gentleman is located. You've probably heard him once or twice uh, over the Sirius XM FC Airwaves. Uh, he hosts the United States of Soccer. It's Jason Davis, and he joins us now. Jason, welcome to Two Up Front, sir. Thank you for having me back. I mean, thank you. Absolutely, Jason. We are we are excited to to have you on the program as well. I immediately, I think we need to we need to I need to clarify this. You guys are talking about this off the air. What is this? What's this deer business? You guys? Are oh, you didn't see about? this? No. What's going on with this? Well, Sarah Sarah was driving the van okay. uh, a couple nights ago, and and she smacked a deer, a big buck. Okay. So it's in the shop now. But for the past few days, I had to drive her van. Okay. You know, being the good husband and taking the lesser safe vehicle. Well, well done. That put me out of me being able to look to Sirius <laughs> XM because she doesn't have it in her car. Okay. So I had tweeted out yesterday to Jason and Brian Dunseth and Eric Winolda that I'm I basically I'm going through withdrawal because of this deer hit. And uh, well, Jason, I'll let you tell Baxter your great reply to that. <laughs> I, I just said that, that it's well known that deer are part of the anti soccer cabal, they're, they're <laughs> trying to hold the dean back from growing in this country. I think uh, that's. Uh, it's it's uh, it's got to be done. Something must be done about them. I'm glad it's deer season, then we can rid the world of a few less soccer hating deer. I guess. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, Jason. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, goal hunting last night for Toronto FC. They put five goals in last night against the Montreal Impact to go seven five overall in aggregate. Uh, what were your initial reactions aside from wow, watching that game last night? Holy crap! I mean, I, it's, <laughs> uh, look, I. I, I you know, talking a lot about that game today on my show, uh, you know, I don't want to get too, you know, I don't want to get too into the weeds about tactics and substitutions. There were a couple of things that happened in that game that were done by the head coaches that made a difference. But come on, that was just two teams having it out. I mean, the, 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 it set up perfectly the way that TFC came back in that first leg, got the two away goals, and at home in front of that big crowd, the biggest game in, in Toronto FC history by a wide margin. Mm-hmm. That was just, it was insanely fun. I mean, there was some ugly stuff happening if you want to break it down and judge the quality of the soccer, but I don't care about that. I care about how entertaining that was. It, it was it was fantastic. Josie Altidore looks like to be, looks like he, he's a man on a mission right now. He may, may very well bring that title to Toronto almost by himself. Yeah, I do got to believe it. You know, Seattle has been more of the Cinderella story on Fox last night. They said, you know, that both these teams are Cinderella stories. I don't know how you can say that about Toronto. Yeah, uh, I don't believe that. But uh, but I got to believe that going into Toronto, you know, Seattle's on a high. I think the one thing Seattle has going for them is a stronger defense than Toronto FC. But but I agree with you, Jason, how hungry Altidore looks, how hungry Bradley actually looked as well. That's going to work a, a lot in their favor. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, d- defense is part of this. Um, I think that you will see sort of a, a cagier uh, setup and, and a different kind of game in the MLS Cup final. Um, I don't know what it was about Montreal and Toronto getting together. Maybe it was the contrasting styles. Uh, you know, Toronto can, can play in the build up. I mean, they can be very direct, don't get me wrong. But they can play in the build up a bit. They want to get uh, Javinko on the ball, you know, 20 yards from goal with his head up. Uh, they've got an Altidore with his back to goal. They they can play some things in closer, while obviously Mon- Montreal wants to run. And and that contrasting styles is sort of like I, I always make the the analogy. It's like boxing matches. Um, yes, yep. you get different styles that always makes for good fights. You don't want two teams who have the same approach. And and I think that Toronto and 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 Seattle they're not exactly alike. And we've seen Seattle make some tweaks in the way they play. Certainly pushing Jordan Morris to the wing. Um, is, is has been a game changer for them in the playoffs. So, you know, we, we could get something, but I do think it's going to be cagier. I do think it'll be um, physical. I, you know, it's going to be it, it, it's going to be a good matchup um, for a lot of reasons, but it may not be nearly as entertaining as what we just saw. Yeah, I would have to agree with you on that one. I, I'm curious too because this game is going to be on Fox, not FS1, not any of those Fox Sports 35 or anything. It's going to be on Fox, the normal cable network. How big of an opportunity is this for MLS to finally? In a, in a major game and a fairly large, major time slot as well too. Eight, you know, eight central on a Saturday or eight Eastern on a Saturday night to 
to maybe bring in a couple more, you know, deer hating MLS <laughs> fans out there. Yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, look, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, of, 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 I'm of two minds, and I and I know that I constantly contradict myself. Yeah, I have, I, I want MLS to grow and get bigger. I mean, that by by virtue of MLS getting bigger, the game of soccer gets bigger. Uh, we have more kids playing, uh, more talented athletes end up playing the sport. The, the clubs get more money, which they can invest in development. All these things are connected then. Then maybe our national team wins a World Cup. I mean, for me, that's sort of the end game. I, I, I want to see MLS grow because I love soccer, but it's also about, hey, let's, let's do that thing that seems impossible. Um, but at the same time, MLS is here. It's not going anywhere. It's grown by leaps and bounds, even over the last 10 years. I mean, I was just thinking about, I, I wrote a piece for ESPN FC about the last five MLS Cup champions, and that takes you back um, to 2000, uh, I think that's 2011, and the Galaxy winning uh, their first title with David Beckham. David Beckham joined this league in 2007. Think about how long, and so did Toronto FC for that matter. Think yeah. about how long that feels in the progress, uh, the progression of Major League Soccer. It feels like a lifetime ago. It's not, but it feels like a long time ago because this league has changed so much. And that that gives me a, a belief, a, a, a strong um, a, a strong attitude that this league's not going anywhere. And so I shouldn't necessarily be concerned about those kinds of things. Um, but again, you know, it's it, it you, you want to see at the very least, I want to see the major league soccer owners push to spend more money on their on their players, which, you know, bigger te television audiences can only help. Exactly. So take this in a completely different direction since you had mentioned the growth of MLS. One of the things that's of grave concern and that Baxter and I talked about at the start of the show, Jason, uh, is what's going on with the NASL. Uh, I know for a while there are. It, 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 you 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 know covered the NASL. You talked about it quite a bit. I'm just wondering if you have any more enlightening information for us who are kind of looking at this, going, "What's going to happen to our second division league?" Well, look, I'm I'm not on the ground um, reporting it day to day. There are people who are doing a good job of that. Uh, certainly, people with contacts. Um, you know, I'm just sort of, I guess, I, a bit of an aggregator in that area. I know some people who do have. Um, inside information a little bit in, in terms of NASL. What, what we're hearing right now is that it's a little all over the place. It's kind of hard to pin down. They just had their their meetings in Atlanta. I, I believe there's a wrapped up, but I haven't checked in on it today. Um, there was a report that, uh, I mean, Snidalotti was absolutely there. He tweeted that he was there. Yep. He mm -hmm. meant mm -hmm. to both NASL and USL parties. Which indicates, you know, and again, the reporting is that USL was on was on hand as well. So if you're a if NASL was just like uh, they they've obviously dealt with the departure of the Rowdies, the departure of Ottawa Fury, uh, the reports heading into the meetings were that the Cosmos were having some problems and had fur furloughed some people. But if NASL was just going to go into 2017, not full steam, they've been hit, but they're they're certainly if they if they've given the the sense that they're they're not going anywhere. But if this was a strong league, then USL wouldn't be there. If there was no possibility whatsoever of more teams bolting or the NASL folding and its teams going to USL or some kind of some kind of um, uh, merging, then USL wouldn't be there. Sino Galati wouldn't be there. So I think just by virtue of that, you have to be very concerned about the, the future of the NASL. I don't think the New York Cosmos shut down their operation, furlough their front office, release a bunch of players, in, 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 because the money is there for their ownership, unless they don't see a path to turning that club into what they wanted to. So clearly, they see the NASL as as a, a path that's no longer worth taking. They don't want to be part of MLS, or sorry, they don't want to be part of USL. Um, they don't want to drop down a the division. They don't want to be part of a league that's out of, that has a partnership with MLS that is, uh, in some ways, the reserve league for for Major League Soccer. So I don't know what the I don't know what the future is for the Cosmos. And I don't know what the future is for the NASL, and I'm thinking we're, we're I think we're getting very close to the to the likelihood that they're going to either you know shut down for 2017 and talk about coming back later after they you know reform or just shutting down altogether. Um, I think it's more likely that happens than they go into 2017 with uh, a, a fully operating league. Yeah, I, I I just hope it doesn't end up being another uh, two years of USSF Division Two league that we had. What was that back in oh seven oh eight or or something to that effect? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was interesting, and and I, I don't know. <laughs> like, again, Galati being there is the kind of thing. I think it was that was two thousand ten. Um, oh, okay. Galati 
know, gives you the sense that look, USL is fine by themselves. They don't need any of the NASL teams. They've got like 50 teams already uh, and growing. Um, but uh, obviously, they would love to add some of those those names and some some of those teams that have strong fan bases and organizations. And and we want teams to continue. I, Absolutely. I, the, the leagues, uh, you know, the leagues matter because they organize things. And I and I've recently talked about American sports is league centric, not club centric. But if there's an opportunity for those clubs to continue on, they have to. Well, let me let me just ask you one last question since we since we are on this about the Cosmos. Is it is it them being stubborn with not wanting to play in USL, or is it they they had a goal? They're looking like they're not going to accomplish that goal, so it's time to close up shop. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, look, that's it's both. I mean, you know, you'll you'll see some people, and I've seen some some pretty strong sort of screeds about the cosmos recently, in, in light of the news that's come out of. There's one over at Post America that basically says, I think Scott Nichols wrote it, that says. You know, let's stop being infatuated with the Cosmos legacy. Let's just drop this whole nonsense because ultimately it, it, it's not doing us any good. And any time the Cosmos kind of come back into American soccer, it presents this sort of false dawn about what they can be, what the league they're in is going to be in this case with NESL. And ultimately all they've done is, you know, folded once and, and now they look like they're on the verge of folding again. Uh, the future of American soccer probably does not involve the name New York Cosmos at the top division. And and there are a lot of reasons for that, but rather than sort of moan and, and complain about it, maybe he's right and maybe we should move on. Well, they, I, they, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and not to be a Debbie Downer, but for crying out loud, they couldn't sell out a 2,500-seat game or a stadium for their uh, championship game this year. They have frittered away the support that they had in that in that area up in uh, up in New York. Obviously, they they had to move that game. It wasn't in their normal home uh, at Hofstra. Um, I was at that championship match. It was it was rather depressing. I mean, the Cosmos did what they could, and I know they have good people in that organization who are trying very very hard. But it was depressing, and I took a you know I took a tour around the stadium. A couple of different times had some people stop me and, and, and want to talk about the situation. I had a guy and his kid, you know, they're there watching the game. They're basically in what amounts to a, a high school football stadium. I mean, it's a soccer stadium, but it's 2,500 people, as you mentioned. And the guy said, you know, but we, we keep coming out, but I, we, I don't know how much longer this is going to last. Hmm. Um, we don't see a future here. We don't see the cosmos getting back all of that, that capital that they've lost in terms of the, the fan base. And, and you know, they... they Hitch their wagon to that stadium plan at Belmont Park. And once it became clear that wasn't going anywhere, and it's not like they got denied, it's just that uh, the New York State Commission that's responsible for handing out that bid has yet to move on it four years later, then I think that was it. That was the writing uh, on the wall. They needed to, to make a decision about whether they were going to continue to fund this because they're not making money. Well, Jason, I want to, of course, the guy who hit the, the deer is the one who has this conversation start out with this exciting stuff about MLS, and, uh, <laughs> and we get to a place where we're talking about the demise of, of a, a historic things, club. Though, it so is, it is, but uh, I personally want to thank you for coming on the show. It's such a pleasure talking to you. No problem, guys. We appreciate it, Jason. Let's uh, let's do this again sometime soon. Before we let Absolutely. you go to, where can people uh, listen to you, of course, and also find you on social media? Uh, well, it's uh, United States of Soccer, 11, uh, 11 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time on Channel 85 on Sirius XM. Um, I know not everybody is uh, inclined to pay for Sirius XM. It's a great service. It's worth it. It is. I it love is. it. <laughs> but if you're not inclined to pay, I understand. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at DavisJSN. Uh, you can, it's a, you know, it's a, a distilled sort of soccer craziness. You can get uh, <laughs> pretty much on any social media platform with that name. Um, and, and I would ask that people, especially on Twitter, maybe on Instagram, follow if only to kind of keep tabs on some other stuff that I've got uh, in the works. I'm, I'm hoping that 2017 is going to be a very, very, very interesting year, not just for me, but for a lot of people in soccer media. It would be fun. Awesome. And, I, and I understand that anybody who wants to argue about promotion relegation needs to seek you out. <laughs> <laughs> Look, no, seriously, though, so I know you're joking, especially since I've been talking about it today, but... I have no problem arguing about the right now. <laughs> no, it's not the it's not the topic that is the problem. It's it's some of the individuals. Yeah, say, it's it's yes. the people. Yes. Yep, that's yep. What, we, we've heard that before. If it's your cause, celebrity. That that's fantastic. Then, then make it that way. Just just don't be a jerk. And this is true about everything. I mean, I'm going to try not to be a jerk about 
uh, about whatever it is that I like because I want people to like that thing with me again. So there we go. Makes, Makes sense. sense. All right, Jason, you're the best, man. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. All right, there goes Jason Davis on the shopfutsal.com. Call in line. We're going to take a final break. When we come back, we'll offer our closing thoughts and uh, – Nah, we'll see what else happens. You never know. we got about eight minutes to fill, so uh, we'll see. Actually, I have a surprise for Simon, so we'll talk about that oh, right after right. this. It's Two Up Front presented by Three Lines Pub. Back after this. Studios. I'm Baxter Colburn. And this is Simon Proban. All right. Great conversation there on the, uh, the the last segment with Jason Davis from the United States of Soccer. He and Kyle Gregg both appearing on the shopfutsal.com. Call in line. Very special thanks to both of those gentlemen for taking time out of their very busy schedules. Yeah, well, us. that's the thing is we, we were working on that interview with Jason Davis for quite a while. A and, and when I say we, I mean you. <laughs> Uh, but man, it was it's great to have him on and just get the insight that he has, you know, again about mm-hmm. the NASL, but also to talk about that amazing game last night, Montreal losing to TFC five to two in the MLS Cup Eastern Conference Final second game aggregate. Whatever else you got to add on to there. Stop, stop, you're done. <laughs> too many, too many words I'm to describe a I'm game. Done. Good, get out of here. We don't want you. No, just kidding. Um, I do think it's a little ridiculous though how many words you have to use to describe one game. <laughs> right. It's like. Okay, we get it. Well, when you know when they score as many goals as they do, I, I guess they have earned the uh, opportunity to right. have to keep adding on titles to the game. That's true. You I know, there's been a lot of talk about, and I don't, I don't know if you were watching MLS then, but there, there's been a lot of talk of was that the best series in the history of MLS, or was it the LA Galaxy San Jose Earthquakes, where the Galaxy had to come back by four goals, I believe, in the second leg. Hmm. I didn't see that. No. Was that the that was the Landon Donovan D Rosario days, wasn't that? Well, I, th- you know what, I have to go back and look. I can't remember if that's they came when back from four goals though. Yeah, and I, I can't remember if that's when Donovan had come back from Germany and was playing now with the Galaxy, Galaxy. instead of San Jose. I can't. I, you know, I'm gonna you look Google this up that. while you you Google that. Uh, quick news piece uh, for you before I get to Simon's surprise. Uh, Oscar Pereja named the MLS Coach of the Year. Simon, I believe you agree with that. He won two trophies. He helped FC Dallas attain the best record in MLS. FC Dallas overall, a fantastic season. You can't really be too upset about it. Uh, of course, injuries, their ultimate demise at the very end. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's unfortunate what happened to them at the end. But look, Oscar Pereira took... I believe the youngest team in MLS to the brink of, well, MLS Cup, but they won the Supporter Shield. They won the U.S. Open Cup. And there's still a lot of hope once all these players get healthy and they return next year. But FC Dallas has done a wonderful job as an organization yes. when we're talking about developing talent. Mm-hmm. And that's the greatest thing to see. And, and they definitely what you have hope, the best academy, I'd have to say. Well, and that's what you hope now is that other clubs are looking at them going, how do we replicate that? Because ultimately, that's what we want across the league. That's what we want for American soccer. You're absolutely right about that. Did you find what you were looking for? You gave me a look like you maybe did. 2003. I don't have on here. I just, I'm on, I'm on the Goog machine. And I don't have the a lot of videos, but no write ups. I just found a write up here, so I'm I'm still searching out whether Landon Donovan was playing. That's with Google, Earthquake. by the way, for those that are like, "What's the Goog machine?" <laughs> Johan it's, Guggenberg made it's, this. That's the way the kids are saying it these days. Are they though? Is that how your <laughs> kids are saying it? That's how I'm saying okay. it. Okay. All right. I said I had a surprise for you, Simon. Um, I I thought we would go back briefly since the MLS season is basically done, and look at how we predicted each conference. To finish back on March second, two thousand. Okay, b- before you do that, before yes. you do that, I, I had the result wrong. It was the earthquakes who came back from a four goal deficit. Yes, right. and okay. that was uh, when Donovan was playing with the earthquakes, but that also included Jeff Agus, mm. uh, 
some other players that honestly I, I should remember. Dero was on that team, wasn't he? Still, it doesn't show on here that he was. Dero Rosario loved him. Great player. I just love the commentators. Anytime he would score a great goal, it's just a fun name to say. Some people just have commentator worthy names. It's great. Anyway, anyway, you still searching? I'm, I'm kind of just skimming through this, but it was November 9th, two thousand three, that this happened. Ah, well, so at least I got the year correct. You did well done. I'm proud of you. teams in there. Just had them on reverse. Anyways, what's your big surprise? Anyway, so my big surprise is if you'll recall back on March second, two thousand and sixteen, you and I both offered who our, our predictions for how the East, me, yep. and how you, the West, would finish. Yeah. So I thought we would take a look at okay, that. This cool, is the first time cool. I've looked at it since the season. I remember who you picked for the uh, Eastern Conference to go to the final. Uh, yeah, I, I just, we have listed at least just the, how we thought that the, the top six would at least Oh, okay, finish, okay. Because so. I could have I could have sworn I remember you saying that you had picked TFC from the get-go to go to the final this year. Oh, if I did, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. How did you, yeah, of course. I'm a brilliant person. Of course that's who I picked. Anyway, let's start with you in the West, Simon. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You're, you're, Do you want to know, yeah, we'll start from start from six. I mean, I, I guess it depends on how we want to judge this. Do you care about where they finished or just the six teams that made it? No, I, I, I am so interested. I, listen, too. I know I didn't do the best. I, my biggest call that I get to brag about is the Rapids making the playoffs. Yes, that, right? is, that is absolutely correct. You had Colorado finishing sixth in the West. I mean, they finished in second in the West, which is fantastic. Uh, you had the Galaxy at number five. They finished in third overall. You had Seattle in fourth. They finished in fourth. Well okay, done. Okay, good. Boom. Point. Bing. <laughs> uh, and then it falls off the rails. You had Portland at, at three. They didn't make the playoffs. You had FC Dallas at two. Uh, oh, did it really? First, yes. Wow. And then you had Vancouver, Vancouver at number one. And Vancouver also missed the playoffs by yes. a hefty yes. margin. But still, you got four out of the six playoff teams no, good. correct. Good. Uh, you got Seattle exactly right, which is awesome. Uh, over in the East for me, uh, I had Montreal finishing in sixth. They finished in fifth. I had TFC in fifth. They finished in third. I had the Revolution finishing in fourth. Well, that didn't work out. Bum, they, bum, 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 bum. I had the Columbus Crew finishing in third. They finished even worse. I had Orlando finishing in second. <laughs> they didn't do well. But I'm I, sorry to have a belly laugh on that But one. I had the Red Bulls at number one, and they finished at number one. <laughs> yeah, so that's how 2016 worked so out. So you had three? I got three, yes. Three out of my six. Uh, you know... I got two, three, and four wrong. Baxter, I, 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 I got to brag a little bit. Go ahead. I, I, I'm undefeated on all of our... You are. You are more soccer-y than I am, <laughs> I guess. Because I got four teams in the playoffs. Yep. You beat uh, me in our predictions. Beat in the predictions the and then uh, fantasy. Yeah, it was a tough year for me, I guess. I did all right. Yeah, I had some good showings, but uh, not... I mean, and to be fair, the Revolution missed the playoffs by... By goal difference. Sure, sure, so absolutely. There's that, yeah. and nobody, I think, really expected Columbus to do as bad as Lee. Bad, badly as they did. Badly is a good is a good term to use for <laughs> for so. Columbus. You can make up words for their their collapse. You can make up words for for uh, Portland's collapse. But the biggest word is injuries. Not making excuses. Yeah. You still have to Truth have that though. depth, and that's what Gavin Wilkinson needs to next work on. But that's all of MLS. You're the right. depth is an issue. Again, because of because of the lack of funds for players. Exactly. You're absolutely correct about that. We have had a terrific show today. Special thanks to Kyle Gregg and Jason Davis for joining us on the shopfutsal.com. Call in line. If you missed any of today's show, you can go and find it on demand on our website, 2upfrontsoccer.com. That's the number two. And you can find that and great information about Simon and I. If you want to get in contact about being a sponsor, guest interviews, all that jazz. You know, I want to say one thing, Baxter, that I was listening to Jason Davis on the way in, as obviously he knew that too from my comment that I made. Yep. One of the things that he said today was, you know, at, at some point, you know, he's uh, he was talking about how thankful he was to be in the position that he's in, mm-hmm. and and you know that that he wants to help out other people get there as well to be on a national radio show, yep. and, and when he when he has time for that opportunity, he wants to he wants to find that payback, and what is it thirty minutes later, yeah. and he's doing that. So you know, big kudos to Jason for jumping on and, and having a great conversation. Absolutely, very special thanks to you, Jason. We appreciate it. All right, Simon, it's been fun. Uh, I'll see you on Tuesday, right? You uh, you won't be here next Thursday. Next though. Thursday, I've got to do a presentation. Presentation, at my Professor. Day job. Yes, that's right. You'll have 
glasses and slicked hair and a suit. And, and I think I'm going to announce this now, Baxter. Uh-oh. Uh, December 20th, that week. I don't know. We haven't talked about that week yet, but yes. I'm, I'm getting surgery that week. Fixing a Are you okay? couple of things. Well, I've, I've got a hernia Ooh. down out of the groin area. <laughs> but I also have a herniated belly button, which I found in the <laughs> exam. So that's getting that fixed, too. Happen? I don't even understand. <laughs> so anyways, so that that week I will be uh, I will be being pampered by my family. Hashtag pray for Simon. I love yeah, it. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, Simon. He's Simon Proven. I'm Baxter Colburn with our manager being the one above. We are two up front.